preach, but you can turn to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll just continue working our way through Colossians 1. Uh, I want to also extend my greetings from Harvest Valley Church, and, and you know, I enjoy Adam's friendship and his partnership in the gospel, and, and so grateful to be here this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29 is what we're going to see this morning. And so, this is uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which makes it God's word for us today. And so he says this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. God, as we come before you this morning, God, I just want to pause for a minute and, and ask that you'd help us, give us ears to hear and eyes to see, give us an understanding, God. Thank you so much for giving us your word and your spirit and your son. God, let there be no distractions. God, let the word that comes out of my mouth, let it bring and bear much fruit. God, may it not return void or fall on the ground and bear no seed. God, let it, let it bear much, much fruit. Thank you. Thank you for your word. God, speak to us, God. We look to you as our Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as, uh, you know, when, when Adam asked me to preach, I just said, man, I, I cannot pick a topic. Just can I just continue what you're doing so he graciously allowed me to do it so we're just going to worship the lord through colossians 1 verses 25 to 29 24 to 29 and so the big idea for us of the message is this that let's proclaim let's proclaim god's message through god's means regardless of the price we pay not an unfamiliar idea. It's not an unfamiliar concept if you're a Christian. We're called from God to preach Christ. I'm not just talking about preaching like what I'm doing right now because that's not the only way the Bible defines preaching. It has three definitions of preaching. One is what I'm doing right now, and the other one is that we just, in our private conversations, we preach the gospel. That's the same word that the Bible uses. And also in our small group time, like in the group setting, in the individual setting, and in, in like public setting, the same word's been used in the New Testament for preaching God's word. So I'm not just referring to what I'm doing because not everyone is to called to be a pastor or to publicly preach the gospel. But the idea that we all are called to make disciples. And the way we make disciples is teaching everyone, right? Baptizing everyone. So the big idea, not just from this text, but also like just basically like a Christian concept, is that we proclaim God's message. And through the means that God has given us, regardless of our suffering or the price we pay. And so the first point is, obviously, what, what is God's message? The message we proclaim. In verse 28, Paul talks about it. He says, him we proclaim. Then even before that, he says, when he talks about his own stewardship of the gospel, of which in verse 25, which I became a ministry according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. Why? What's the goal of this stewardship that Paul has received? That is to make the word of God fully known. Make the word of God fully known. So... The, not only the message we proclaim, but what is the content of our message is that the word of God. It's not just not talking about ourselves, 
We're talking about someone, the content. It's Christ. Him we proclaim. Verse 28, warning everyone and teaching everyone. I'm just, when Paul says him we proclaim in verse 28, it's not, it's not no matter whatever the question is that, you know, we talk about in our culture that Jesus is the answer, respective of the question, right? There's always this joke that in the Sunday school teaching where, where the kids are asked, hey, you know, what is the thing in the tree that's brown and eats nuts and stays in the tree? And the kid responds, you know, I know the answer to be squirrel, but somehow I'm in the Sunday school, I have to say it's Jesus. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. Right? There's always this slogan that Jesus is, the an- Jesus is the answer, but we don't talk about what is the question. That is not even what I'm talking about. But this idea that when Paul says, him we proclaim, is that Jesus is not only the content of our message, but also that his whole power, his authority, and the secret that has been revealed to us, to the saints, the mystery hidden for ages, that the promised Messiah through the Old Testament, he's coming, he's going to live a perfect life and he's going to die on the cross for our sake and then he's going to rise from the dead the whole person and the whole work of jesus him we proclaim it's not just about using the words jesus and then talking about some moralistic principles on how we live our life it's not just the idea that oh we just use the name jesus just let's just go back to what Paul talks about Christ in verse 15 he says he's the image of the invisible God Paul preaches Christ because in Christ the fullness of God dwells he preaches Christ because he's the one who bought our righteousness he preaches Christ because through him we will get the fullness of maturity and our end goal as a Christian right in Romans 8 for all things work together for our good. What is that good? That is, God says, those whom he predestined, he wants them to be conformed to the image of his son. So him we proclaim. Why? Why we proclaim him? Because we want everyone to be mature in Christ. That's the end goal. So we come to the fullness of the man who present everyone mature in Christ. Then I got other verses that describe why Paul emphasizes that is that in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 19, verse 15, in whom the image of, he is the image of the invisible God. So the visible disclosure of God in Christ. Then verse 13, that he is uniquely qualified to disclose the creator. Just in the same chapter, Paul is describing to us who is Christ. And then he says, him we proclaim. You can see in other verses too, even in Jesus' own description of his ministry, when he talks to Pharisees in John 5, he says, you search the scriptures thinking that in that you find eternal life. But Jesus says, no, it's all our prophesying about me. In Luke 24, on the road to the Emmaus village, where Jesus talking to his two disciples, what was he doing? He's explaining to his disciples concerning himself from Moses, prophets, and writings that means basically the old testament jesus is explaining about himself him we proclaim doesn't mean that we just use the word jesus and then just talk about ourselves or talk about some moralistic principles or how to be a good dad mom husband wife or good neighbor good roommate no him we proclaim is that in fullness of what christ has revealed in the Old Testament, from the Old Testament, and then what he accomplished, and then how the apostles saw that and explained it about him in its fullness. Because through him, we get our righteousness. Through him, we know what God has done. So not only the content, but also our method, right? Paul describes it in verse 28. Again, he says, him we proclaim. What is, how does he do it? He says, warning everyone and teaching everyone. So he's just two participles saying, I'm teaching everyone, I'm warning everyone. It's the same word, warning, is also can be used for admonishing. In Acts 20, when he's talking to the Ephesian elders, he says, for three years I've preached to you the gospel message in public and in private, admonishing everyone. So it's the same word. 
Here, the ESV translates, it says warning. And then also in there, it translates, it says admonishing. But the word is same, the idea is same. So the first one I want to say is teaching. It's not just focused on imparting some truth. It's explaining, teaching people what Christ has done. Him we proclaim, teaching everyone. Then in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, Notice it says, Paul, again, talking to the same people, he says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were, what? Taught. So how we know, receive Christ, and we walk in him, and we are rooted in him, and are we built up in him, is when the apostles and the other leaders came and taught them about Jesus. So when they were taught, they were receiving Christ, they were established in Christ, and they are, building, they are being built up. So we teach Christ, we explain the gospel, we just not only, it's not the same attitude as take it or leave it. And he talks about admonishing and warnings. It's the idea that, no, we want not only to teach the people, we want them to be transformed. We're pleading with others. Paul says, I was in tears for three years, night and day, every day, preaching the gospel, admonishing everyone. So it's not the same idea that you take it or leave it. I just, I'm just going to, because it's my responsibility to share the gospel, I'm just going to share it, but then it's up to you. You want to take it or not. Yes, in a sense, it is up to them. So in a sense, if there's no urgency in our own lives, the way we view the gospel message, the proclamation of the gospel message, others probably won't see it. Teaching, and then he says admonishing implies that truth taught in the gospel demands a response. That's why Paul says, I urge you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled. I urge you, I plead you, I beg with you to be reconciled. There's never take it or leave it kind of attitude. So there's an urgency, there's a pleading, and then there's a transformation. That's all including in the word admonishing and warning. Why do we warn someone? It's because when they're going on the wrong path, tell them, hey, that path leads to destruction. Go in a different path. Go in a different direction. Go to Christ. We warn others so that we are saving them, leading them in the path of righteousness. Warning everyone, teaching everyone. Admonition. One author says it's an urgent, passionate appeal to hearers to respond appropriately to God's truth. He says, as Paul reminds the Ephesian elders of his own ministry of the word among them, he says, for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. It's not just the content about Christ, right? He's also warning people. He's urging them to respond, to be reconciled, to transform, to forget, to lay aside your path of unrighteousness and walk in obedience, teaching them what it means, pleading them, with them. That's what he's doing, the method. And then talks about its scope. Same verse. Him we proclaim, warning who? Audience participation, warning who? Good. And teaching who? Everyone. With all wisdom, our scope of our proclamation is who? Does it say few? Does it say only to Christians? Or does it say only to your neighbors? To who? Everyone. Even think about the Great Commission, right? When, when Jesus talked about teaching the gospel. Right, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, 
And then what he says, teaching them some of what I said or everything, right? Everything. Not only everything of what Jesus has taught, but then to who? To everyone, right? Paul, again in Romans 1, he's talking about his own ministry, like he's talking here. He says his ministry, the scope of his ministry is so great and so glorious that he's a debtor to all people, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the fools. I mean, in that time, that's how Romans differentiated people, right? They said, you're Greek and then non-Greeks. You're wise and you're barbarians. That's the way they looked at. So basically what Paul is saying is my ministry, the scope of my ministry is to everyone. And he says, I'm a debtor. It's an obligation for me to go and preach the gospel to everyone. And he says, my goal is that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That doesn't mean that the salvation, everyone's going to believe and accept Christ. But those that are actually believing in Christ and placing their faith in Christ, the goal for them is maturity. That people are becoming mature day after day in Christ. That's the goal. That's who a disciple is, is having this constant relationship with Christ, constant growth in Christ, and then also making disciples. Uh, we are a disciple, and we make disciples. There's this constant growth in us. So that's the goal. So based when we, the message we proclaim, and the way we do it is we teach, we admonish, and the content is that Christ, and our scope is to everyone, and our goal is spiritual maturity and progress. And Paul doesn't stop there. He says the reason we do this is because, not because I'm just having a good day. Not because I just feel good about myself or not just because I'm a good communicator of God's word. Not because I'm a Pharisee or I have a PhD or an MDiv. No. Because of the grace I've received from Christ. Notice again, I'm going to read verse 25. It says, for which I became a minister. What did he become a minister? He says in verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. When I read that, I thought, come on, Paul, at least once in a while have a bad day. What do you mean you rejoice in, <laughs> in sufferings? To rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. It says, for which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me. Basically, what Paul is saying is, I'm doing all this is because God has entrusted me with the stewardship. So the ministry, friends, that we have, it's not because of some one bright day we woke up and decided that, oh, I slept well last night, so I'm going to do ministry today. No, the idea that, no, actually God has entrusted me with this ministry. So now the only obligation I have is to be faithful. Having received this ministry from God, right, we do not lose heart. So why we want to proclaim is because of the grace of God that he entrusted us with this stewardship. And please don't think it's just for this kind of responsibility or ministry. When I use the word ministry, it's for pastors or leaders of the church. We know that's for everybody. What pastors and elders are, what they're doing is they're just exemplifying that kind of lifestyle. So they're not entangled with sin or other responsibilities so they can freely give to the ministry. But the role and the responsibility, just think about the responsibilities of the pastors and the leaders. Even if you look at 1 Timothy 3. Except for husbands being the husband of one wife, 
everything that was described in there is actually for every Christian. Well, we all are called to be patient. We all are called to be hospitable. We all are, even Colossians 3, right? Paul tells the church, teaching one another in all wisdom. We all are called to teach one another in some form, whatever that is. We all are to worship Christ. So the commands that pastors are doing, they're just exemplifying what is already supposed for every Christian to do. So when I talk about the ministry that we're supposed to live, I'm just don't, I don't want you to think in your head that, oh, he's just talking about the pastors or the church leaders. No, this is actually for all Christians. This is who we're supposed to be. When we see a person that's exemplifying, we appoint them as leaders. But until then, we are supposed to be in this ministry. We are entrusted with the stewardship of the gospel. Not only the way we proclaim, but also we pass it on to the next generation. And how we do it if you don't proclaim it? How do we do it if you don't preach it to others? The stewardship that has been entrusted to us. And our responsibility is not to be creative. Our responsibility is just to pass it on. That's what stewards do, right? You think about like the waiter or waitress at a restaurant. When the chef makes, prepares food, in the South they say like when he fixes food, I ask all the time, what do you mean fixing food? Is something wrong with it? But that's the expression we all use, right? He's fixing food. When he fixes the food, the job of the waiter or waitress is not to like change anything, just to make sure that he just brings it to the customer. And our job as the stewards, as the servants of Christ, is not to improvise what the gospel is, or not to improvise whatever God has revealed to us, but to just proclaim it and to preach it and to explain it to others. We gotta make sure that we bring it hot so others can enjoy it. But we don't improvise on the gospel. The gospel is already good enough. It is powerful enough to save people. So we're stewards, and not only that, the grace we receive is that we are empowered by Christ. And again, verse 26, says the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. This is some mystery, this secret. It has been a secret for a long time, but now it has been revealed. And verse 27 says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And that secret is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How are we empowered? to proclaim God's message because we have Christ in us. What was the mission of Jesus Christ? He came to seek and save the lost. Right? And if he's in us, how, was, how does our life demonstrate that he is in us when we participate in his mission? When we partake in his mission, right? The way he lives, it's an example for us. And then Paul talks about in Philippians 2, though he's in the form of God, did not count equality with God, thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, became a servant. If Christ is in us, what kind of lifestyle we would demonstrate? Servants, stewards. The power, and not only that, in verse 29, he says, For this I thought, I was struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I'm toiling, I'm struggling, I'm laboring. Why? Because Jesus is working in me. He's empowering me, giving me strength. Friends, if you ever feel burned out or confused, tired, you need to pause and meditate on this idea that yes, I'm working hard, I'm struggling, not just to live a Christian life, but to obey the commandments. You must always remember that he who called you is able to preserve you, 
and able to strengthen you. And then last night, the reason I was standing in the back is being totally transparent. I'm struggling and recovering from a concussion. I cannot take music or lights, cannot sleep. And last night, as I'm working on this message, I'm just praying, God, like, renew the strength. Give me more strength. Give me strength. So that it doesn't make sense for me to talk about that Jesus is going to empower you and then I struggle here to be able to communicate the gospel. When you are in that position, because it is easy, especially as you plan the church, especially as you work in different hours, extra hours, to set up the chairs, to tear it down, to assemble and to make coffee and to prepare everything, to have the worship practice, it is easy for us to get tired. And when that happens, we need to pause and meditate and know, yes, I'm doing all this. And also I rejoice in my sufferings. Why? Because there's someone else that is actually working in me, empowering me to do it. Paul was so confident in this in 1 Corinthians 1 when he's talking to the Corinthians about the gospel message that he came just he was reminding them they were glorying in the speech and the rhetoric. And he says, brothers, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquent or lofty speech. I came in weakness. That's something that you don't put that on Time magazine to go and preach in front of others in weakness. But Paul says, I did that came in weakness so that the power of your transformation can be relying on the spirit. I was trying to humble myself. That doesn't mean that I don't work hard. That doesn't mean that I don't prepare. That doesn't mean that I don't study God's word. I won't spend my time in prayer. But I'm doing all that because when the dust settles, only one person that gets the glory. It's not me. It's God. Because he's the one that's enabling us, empowering us to accomplish his mission. And I want to tell you, he's going to accomplish his mission regardless of whether we're going to participate in it or not. But it is a wasted opportunity for us when we don't partake in God's mission because that's guaranteed, right? He is going to accomplish his purposes. He is going to accomplish his mission. Whether we're going to partake it or not, it's up to us. And he's saying he's empowering us, he's entrusting us with this stewardship, and he's helping us because of that, because of this stewardship, because of what the gospel message is about now. I'm not concerned about the price I pay. The grace we received enable, should enable us, should empower us. For what? For the price, for the cost it takes to stand in the ministry, to go on. I still remember the first semester in my seminary the professor asked, there were six, about 60 students in the class. The professor asked to stand, four students, four students, he asked the four students to stand up, and he said to all of us to look at those four students, and he said, 10 years from now, the statistics are the way they're going right now. Only four of those would withstand in the 60 people. Among the 60 people, only four would stay in ministry, and the rest of them, they're going to quit the ministry and do something else. That's about 10%. It's easy to get burned out. It is easy that we don't want to pay the price. But that's why we have to always remember why we're doing what we're doing and who's enabling us to do it. That's why we are willing to pay the price. The price we pay, verse 24, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Friends, Christians are such a weird people. 
not saying in a negative way, but who would say, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I want to suffer for your sake. No one would say it. But isn't that the beauty of our religion is that, that we are willing to suffer for others' sake. And he's saying, I rejoice in it. Not only that I'm willing, but also I rejoice in it. And he says, and in my flesh, I'm feeling of what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. It doesn't mean that Christ's atonement on the cross is not lacking anything, that Paul has to come back and, and fill it up. Christ has accomplished. That's what he said in the, earlier in the chapter 1, right? Christ has already accomplished his mission. Why don't I just remind you in verse 21, it says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So that doesn't mean that Paul saying that, hey, there's something lacking in Christ's atonement that I have to fill it up. But what he's saying is I'm participating in Christ's suffering. When Christ said, you know, there is a cost that you pay, anyone comes after me? He doesn't take up his own cross. He's not my disciple. That's the idea that Paul is using here. It is that I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. In my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions because I'm partaking in Christ's afflictions. Christ suffered for our sins once for all. But then also his suffering was a different kind of suffering where he was beaten, mocked. There's one thing that he took the wrath of God, but then there's also this physical suffering that he endured for our sake. Paul did the same thing. He endured this physical suffering over and again. And the worst thing is in Galatians, he says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus Christ. In Galatians 4, he says, now I'm in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Ladies, moms, is childbirth an easy thing? Is it a piece of cake? Yes, no. Because <laughs> I, we have two kids. And as far as I know, with my wife, it wasn't easy for her. But Paul says, that's how much I feel the pain until Christ is formed in you. So now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And then verse 29 says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy. Write it down here. Saying we got to remember that there are no pain-free zones for disciples. You should not be surprised with suffering. And especially if you want to partake and share the secret with others. So one author says this. He says, we often, so little gospel fruitfulness in our lives is the result of that we are trying to immunize ourselves against all sufferings for the sake of Christ. We know there's a great suffering in the apostles and in Christ. And we also know that there was a great fruit in their lives. And friends, partly we don't, probably don't have much fruit in our lives, in our ministries, because we're not willing to suffer trying to protect ourselves immune ourselves from all kinds of suffering Paul says I share the secret regardless of the price I pay I really don't want you to see this as an upper level of discipleship right where it says like you know if you're a Christian you're just on, on some level of uh, benefit plan Right, I get all the benefits. I want to be a Christian, but then I don't want to be a disciple because there's a price that I need to pay. That is not the New Testament theology. We partake in Christ's sufferings. We walk with him. He took the cross. And we, take, we carry our own cross. It's not an upper level discipleship or like the elephant in the room in many churches today, at least in North America, is that this notion that for somehow 
can be a Christian, but I don't have to be a disciple. But I can be a Christian, but I don't have to be a disciple because I don't want to pay the price, but I'll make sure that I'll be on the benefit plan. That's not what New Testament teaches. That's not what Jesus taught. That's not what the apostles are teaching or exemplifying their lives with. It says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy. For this, why is he toiling? Because he's doing something. He's proclaiming. What is he proclaiming? And then verse 24, it says, the secret, the mystery that is Christ in you, in the Gentiles. So the Jews believe that the Messiah is coming for them. But then the secret has been revealed that, no, it's actually also for Gentiles. And then not only that, that God who dwelled among the Jews is now also dwelling among Gentiles and in them. So the secret is out. So many people are hearing this secret. Are they hearing from our mouth? That's the question we got to ask. All right? We need, it's the way I've said, like, Christians are weird people because they're rejoicing in their sufferings for others' sake. So I've read the church history throughout the ages. So the people that were most joyful are the people that were more obedient to Christ. Because, again, the notion that Be a Christian means I'm on the benefit plan. To be a disciple means I got to pay the price. That means, oh gosh, come on, I got to live in misery now. That is a false way of looking at the ministry and what a disciple means. Because why would, if it's a life of misery, Paul would, of all the people, rejoice in it? Could it be, could it be that we, are living in this misery because we're not willing to obey Christ. Is that possible? Because I guarantee you, friends, that the misery that we have is not because we're being obedient to Christ. It's not because we're sacrificing our lives for Christ. That's not a miserable life. That's a joyful life. Could be that we are in misery because we're not willing to pay the price. They were joyful. They were celebrating, even while they were in prison. Paul is writing this letter from prison. But the reason we don't want to pay the price is because we think that leads to us to a, some kind of miserable life. I guarantee you, based on the authority of God's word and also the examples throughout the church history, the people were joyful because of their sacrifice, because of their commitment to God. Joy can be found even in the sacrifice, not misery. Joy. That's why Paul is rejoicing in the sufferings. And then... Why are we willing to share the secret? Because of what it does to others. It also increases in their spiritual maturity. It also gets new disciples. Go to all nations, to everyone. The scope is to everyone. That's the reason we struggle and we toil. So that Christ is honored, Christ is glorified, the glory, the riches of the glory of this mystery, that Christ in you, the hope of glory, is being revealed and people are being transformed. That's why I struggle. That's why I work hard with all his energy that is working through me. Let's pray. God. Father, would you help us to...